Have you ever wondered how your computer is able to run thousands of programs at the same time? You are probably thinking about multi-core systems, which is not unexpected, given the recent push by CPU manufacturers suggesting that more cores means better performance. What some people ignore is that multitasking has been around since those days when computers had a single CPU. Today, we are going to learn the fundamentals about concurrency, a technique that lets computers run multiple processes simultaneously, even if they're equipped with just one CPU. Hi friends, my name is George, and this is Core Dumped. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them later. Back in the mid-80s, computers like the Commodore Amiga and Apple Macintosh already could run multiple programs at once, despite having only one processor. So, how did they do it? To understand, we need to go back further in computer history. As is well known, early computers were very primitive. These monsters, also known as mainframes, were massive machines that filled entire rooms. They were so expensive that only governments, big companies, and some universities could afford them. And considering that these things were top technology in the entire world, not even these wealthy entities could afford many of them, not to mention the operation and maintaining costs. I mean, just imagine having one of these things for each accountant in your company or each researcher in a university. Access to computers was very limited back then, often requiring appointments scheduled weeks in advance. Mostly due to the invention of transistors, eventually mainframes became smaller, though still pricey. But efforts were not only focused on shrinking the size, but also on boosting processing speed. Although computers were becoming faster, operating them was still complicated. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, let me give you an example. To run a program written in some programming language, Fortran, for instance, the computer couldn't just take the source code and execute it, as we do with languages like Python in modern days. Before, the compiler needed to be loaded onto the computer. At that time, it was common to store programs in magnetic tapes. So, it was the programmer's responsibility to mount this tape and wait for the compiler to be loaded in main memory. Only when the compiler was ready to run, the programmer would input the source code to be translated to assembly language, which still couldn't be executed by the computer because it needed to be compiled again down to machine code by another program called an assembler. So, temporarily, it was necessary to store the assembly output, whether on tapes, punched cards, or other storage methods of the time. The procedure required mounting another tape with the assembler, requiring the programmer to wait once again. Once loaded, the assembler would take the compiler output and translate it into machine code that the computer can run. Only then the program could be executed. As you can see, a significant amount of setup time could be involved in the running of a single program. And if something went wrong, it might have meant starting all over again. This setup time was a real problem. While tapes were being mounted or the programmer was typing commands, the CPU sat idle. But even though it was doing nothing, other programmers still couldn't use it because computers were designed to be used by one user at a time. And remember, in the early days, few computers were available, as they cost millions. Thus, computer time was extremely valuable, and owners wanted their computers to be used as much as possible to get as much as they could from their investments. This is when early operating systems were born. The rest of this story deserves its own video. What's pertinent for us right now is that researchers eventually conceived the notion of enabling multiple users to connect to a single computer simultaneously, but with the operating system arbitrating access to the hardware. Under this approach, each user accessed the computer through some type of input and output device, such as a teletypewriter or a dumb terminal. By the late 70s, dumb terminals were the preferred I.O. device. Don't let this thing confuse you. It might seem like a vintage computer but it is just a screen with a keyboard used to send commands to the computer and display the output. When these things were disconnected from the computer, they were completely useless. Hence, the interesting name. The story of terminals is kind of fascinating. As an interesting fact, this is why that little program you use to do something on your computer by writing commands is called a terminal. This arrangement enabled the computer to execute one user's programs while others were either loading theirs or awaiting user input. But what if multiple users were ready to run their programs simultaneously? Well, in that situation, things get more complicated. As the computer disposes of one processing unit, users would have to share it somehow. 
Remember that a program is just a sequence of instructions for the computer's CPU to execute one by one. If multiple programs are ready for execution, the straightforward approach would be to execute them sequentially. However, even though the CPU would always be utilized here, users would have to wait a long time to start seeing results from their programs. To address this problem, programs can be broken down into smaller segments and interleaved so that the CPU can execute them in an alternate order. Now, you might think that this makes no sense, since everything is still being executed sequentially. But keep in mind that computers, even early ones, were thousands of times faster than humans at performing calculations. So, these tiny fractions of a program would ideally be executed very fast. So fast that we, as persons, would be under the illusion that all programs are being executed at the same time. This kind of operating system received a special name. Multix was one of the first time-sharing operating systems of all time. Later in the late 70s, early 80s, computers started arriving on the home market. As they were intended to be used by one user at a time, they got the name Personal Computers, which somehow remains until today. However, when personal computers first came into play, they were designed to run one program at a time and were incapable of multitasking. But Multix, which inspired the creation of Unix, had been around for quite a while at that point. Since concurrency was already a known technique, it didn't take too much time until PC manufacturers started shipping personal computers capable of multitasking. Instead of using concurrency to allow multiple users to use the same computer at the same time, it was used to allow a single user running multiple programs at the same time. If you know a bit about how computers run instructions, you probably understand that we can't just divide programs and mix them together. In this animation, I'm not saying programs are actually divided and loaded into memory like that. Instead, it demonstrates the sequence of processes being carried out. How this is achieved is exactly what we'll discuss next. But before getting into it, we need to understand how CPUs handle instructions, which is exactly what I'm going to show you after a quick message from our sponsor, Brilliant. If you're following this channel, it's probably because here, we don't just talk, we explain concepts with intuitive animations, which make the learning process enjoyable. Traditional studying sometimes can feel like endless reading with no real engagement. But with Brilliant, learning isn't just about reading text, it's about diving in and interacting with the courses. This can help you a lot if you want to become a better problem solver, which is what distinguishes good from average developers. You can find all kinds of computer science related courses, like the latest course on how large language models work, where you can get hands on with real language models. Learn the fundamentals about this technology that is currently changing the world. Learn why the training data is important and even learn how to tune an LLM by yourself to generate different kind of output. You can get for free 30 days of Brilliant Premium and a lifetime 20% discount when subscribing by accessing brilliant.org slash core dumped or using the link in the description below. And now, back to the video. Inside the CPU, there are special registers like the instruction register and the address register. The address register holds the memory location of the next instruction the CPU will execute. When the CPU is ready for the next instruction, it fetches this value and copy it to the instruction register. The CPU then decodes this to know what to do next, an addition, a subtraction, a copy operation, whatever. After the instruction is executed, the address register value increases, pointing to the next instruction. This is basically how CPUs go through instructions step by step. Repeating this cycle, fetch, decode, and execute. There are also jump instructions. They change the address register value, making the CPU jump to a specific instruction instead of the next one in line. This is key for dealing with conditions and loops in programs. Because of this, programs don't have to be literally split and mixed. Instead, they're loaded normally, and the operating system makes the CPU switch between them by changing the address register value. Our concern right now is, when is the operating system itself executed? Because remember, the operating system is also software. It needs the CPU to do its job. When a program starts running, it's labeled as a process. 
the operating system employs a specific data type to store the details of each running process. These processes are lined up in a queue, which is overseen by a special part of the operating system known as a scheduler. When the CPU becomes available, another component called the dispatcher steps in. It selects the topmost element from the queue, reads the process information, and configures the address register so that the CPU can access that process in memory. Keep in mind that I'm omitting a lot of information here. This is actually way more complicated, and I'm only telling you what's necessary for this video. But don't worry, because a dedicated video about CPU scheduling is already planned. Okay, but we still haven't answered the question. How does the operating system manage to run itself to do all of this work? When we write programs, we don't explicitly code instructions to give the CPU back to the operating system, right? Well, that's what we might think. In practice, programs depend on the operating system to perform essential tasks. When we use functions to open a file, read and write to it, or things like requesting memory, we are interacting with the operating system. These interactions occur through interruptions at the hardware level. Interruptions act as signals to the CPU. When an interruption occurs, the CPU pauses its current task, saves its state by taking a snapshot saving it in memory, and immediately jumps to a predefined location in memory where the interrupt service routine associated with that specific interruption resides. This routine is somewhere in the memory region allocated to the operating system itself. Programs use interruptions extensively, especially for I.O. operations, as only the operating system kernel can handle interactions with hardware. This is how the operating system regains control of the CPU. Now that the address register is pointing to the operating system code, the operating system can use the CPU not only to handle the interruption, but to attend other tasks, including scheduling processes. Since I.O. operations often take time, the process that initiated the interruption is temporarily placed back in the queue while waiting for the hardware response. But before, the process's captured state is stored within the process information. Then, the dispatcher selects another process from the queue and sets the CPU to execute it. Now this process can utilize the CPU until at some point it needs some sort of I.O. operation, requiring giving control back to the operating system. This cycle repeats continuously until it's the turn of our process again. When the process is taken from the queue, its state is read and restored in the CPU, jumping to the correct location in the user program to resume exactly where it left off. And this is the process that allows the operating system to alternate CPU usage among multiple processes. But there is a huge problem with this approach. Once the CPU is allocated to a process, it retains control until the process voluntarily releases either by terminating or entering a waiting state by invoking the operating system. Consider an infinite loop scenario. If there are no interruptions inside the loop, the CPU will endlessly execute those instructions. If a process intentionally or unintentionally avoids making interruptions, the operating system will never regain control. In modern times, this poses a serious security risk, as malicious programs can exploit this vulnerability to monopolize CPU resources, preventing other programs from accessing them. This scheduling method, reliant on process cooperation, is known as cooperative scheduling or non-preemptive scheduling. Unfortunately, there's no software fix for this issue, so hardware intervention is necessary. To prevent any user program from completely taking over the CPU, a hardware timer is employed. Its function is straightforward. A time limit is set, and it begins counting down. Once the time expires, the timer triggers an interruption. The timer is typically implemented within the CPU itself. So, before allocating the CPU to any process, the operating system dispatcher uses a privileged instruction to set and start the timer. While processes can still relinquish the CPU by triggering interruptions, if a process takes too long to do so, the timer ensures that the operating system will eventually regain control. This mechanism known as preemptive scheduling offers increased security. However, an operating system can only implement it if the hardware supports it. If you look at the history of home computing, you'll find out that Windows used cooperative scheduling up until version 3. From Windows 95 and subsequent versions, 
Windows has been using preemptive scheduling. Interestingly enough, Multics was designed to support preemptive scheduling right from the start. This is particularly fascinating given that we're discussing systems developed back in the 1960s. And finally, what's the deal with multi-core systems? Well, it's simple. Rapidly switching between processes can create the illusion of simultaneous execution, but as the number of running processes increases, the time it takes for each process to regain CPU access also increases, leading to noticeable lag. To address this, there are both software and hardware solutions. On the software side, a more complex scheduler can help manage processes more efficiently. We will discuss this in a future episode. As for hardware solutions, one option is to increase the CPU speed, allowing processes to regain CPU time faster. However, this approach has its limits due to physical constraints. The breakthrough came with the addition of multiple processing units to the same chip, creating multi-core systems. With multiple cores, the scheduler can allocate different processors to different programs, enabling true parallelism and simultaneous execution. Despite this, there can still be more processes than cores, requiring concurrency to efficiently distribute processing resources among numerous processes in multi-core systems. And just for reaching this part of the video, I'll leave you with this beautiful phrase. Concurrency is about dealing with lots of things at once, but parallelism is about doing lots of things at once. And this is all you need to understand this topic. Now you are ready for more complex concepts, like scheduling, threads, and race conditions, which we will explore in future episodes. This video has been quite lengthy, but I hope you found it enjoyable. If you did, please hit the like button, that would help me a lot. And if you want to learn more, don't let the AI voice scare you. I really try to produce quality content, so consider subscribing and following me on other platforms.